from the Virginia Audio Collective at WTJU 91.1 FM and Brown College at the University of Virginia, this is Circle of Willis, human stories of the science that shapes our world. As a developmental psychologist, you you have to acquire a lot of different skills, one yeah. of them being intentionally clumsy in front of a toddler. <laughs> Kids are maybe quite um, smart in their helping, that they're making the right inferences um, in these situations and, and know how to help. Welcome back to Circle of Willis. I'm your host, Jim Cohn. And I'm the producer, Sage Tangway. Today, we are watching videos of babies. <laughs> Do you know what these videos are? Um, well, they are adorable. But clearly there's more going on here, so tell us a little bit about them. So these are the recordings of a series of experiments by today's guest, Felix Varnikin. Uh, and basically in each one he's doing this simple task in front of a toddler, except he does it really terribly. He's a total doofus. He keeps dropping blocks. He's losing spoons. He's reaching for objects just out of his grasp. <laughs> and these kids, these very young kids, seem to know exactly what to do. Yeah, they sort of stare at him for a moment and then very matter-of-factly toddle over and help him out. It's very cute. It is very cute. And while it also seems simple and kind of natural, the ideas and purposes behind Varnikin's work here are a bit more hefty. The motivating uh, question is to understand, like, what are the origins of our social behavior and that obviously uh, we engage in a lot of selfish behavior. And sure. the assumption often is that that's basically all we do. So even if we are cooperating, it's just something on the surface. And right. deep down, it's all selfishly motivated. OK, so we're really talking about altruism here. Exactly. We'll start by hearing a little bit about Felix's educational background and then move into his studies which are as fascinating as they are precious. You're from Germany. Where did, where I am, did, yeah. where, where were you? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Tübingen and Berlin. So okay. Tübingen, a small cool university town. Yeah, tu and, Tübingen and is tiny. Yeah, 80,000. So and like if the students aren't there, it's fairly dead. It's really? Like, yeah. yeah. The, a little bit like Charlottesville here. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah similar I see. Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What'd you do? What did your parents do? What, what, what was your, what's your story? I want to get your story. Oh, my there. story. My God. What, uh, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm going for everything. <laughs> so my parents, they're now retired, but my, my mother was actually a professor in Berlin oh, cool. for a design school. And uh, my father, an anthropologist in, in Tübingen. You said you're a psychologist, but that's pretty, the stuff you do reminds me a lot of evolutionary anthropology. Yeah, so it's it's true. I mean, so my my mother actually was also um, is more of of an anthropology kind, but they're they're not evolutionary anthropologists. So basically, what they've been interested in in their work was to look at like everyday behaviors uh -huh. and what they signal about culture. When you think about studying human cultures, there's a lot about statues and contracts and the, and the emperors and right, kings right, and so right, forth, right? right. But what, what they've been doing is more look at how is culture is embedded in like everyday activities and everyday objects. So what, what does it tell you about how, and this is what my mother's been doing, uh, how people furnish their apartments. So that everybody thinks like, oh, this is my individual style. Yeah. But then when you look at it, when it's maybe uh, not so individual, not so, not so individual, like, I mean, obviously <laughs> an individual with, with a certain frame, but like the people she uh, visited to look at their homes that were like designers and architects in the 90s, they just had uh, like no curtains. And so this is in, really? in Germany, they had no, no curtains, white walls, uh, like wooden floors. Very minimal. Minimalist, completely yeah. minimalist and like nothing. Yeah. So yeah. it just completely minimalist, steel, wood, white. That's what they do. And then when you look at, at other um, people, like maybe more from a working class background, they would want to create a warm home with like Stuff nice, ni around. yeah, like nice sofas and the TV set is centrally located in the middle of the living room and um, and these kinds of things or maybe have tapestry walls with pictures and so forth. So, uh, but then it's kind of coherent um, within each, each kind of uh, uh, subculture or whatever. So I think what 
maybe motivated me for my own work looking at what my parents have been doing is that you see a lot in apparently mundane things. Like a kid picking up a clothespin, you think like, yeah. so what? But yeah, then when you, yeah, when you yeah. understand a little bit more of the implications of this, maybe you can see that. So I'm, I was, I'm trying to always look for, for the things, the little things, but that, that carry a lot of meaning rather than maybe thinking about like just only what's really completely visible to you as big is yeah. is actually meaningful. Yeah, yeah. I talked so, to I talked to Judy Deloach about uh, about some of her work as well, and she she uh, she was describing just seeing her kid trying to sit on a little toy sofa. Oh, all right. right? So this, and, yeah. and it was, she's like, "What the hell is she doing that oh, for?" All right. Yeah, that is amazing. You know, sort of taking seriously what you see in the world, very mundane things. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Can be revelatory. Yeah. That's right. I mean, now I'm a professor, so yeah. I don't get to test the yeah. kids, right? There's my grad students doing that. You don't get that. to do anything anymore. I don't get to do anything, right? It's just like <laughs> see the numbers I and know. try to write papers. I but, feel you. But this is the thing, yeah, that you just be vigilant and see these things. And um, so it's kind of sad in some sense that the helping study, I started piloting a study with the kids. I was playing with the kid and then Beautiful seeing certain things too. that, I, yeah, so that Judy... Um, discovered it by by looking kids at yeah, yeah to see it's more. just you yeah. just see stuff happening you take it seriously and you start investigating it I and mean, that's one of the things I mean I even used to do clinical work so I used to see people in in therapy uh, you know work uh -huh. with war veterans and things and uh, I miss that engagement too because a lot of my work my scientific work grew from things that popped into my head from how people behaved. Uh, uh, you know, I see. Just, just to, uh, so these, be these there the on the you, ground, embedded. Right, to be in, in there. Yeah, yeah, right, right. right. You kind of, when you, when you get into to doing the, the more sort of professorial stuff, it's it's harder to be at that level. Yeah, that yeah. level. Right. Yeah. So where'd you go to undergraduate school? So I was at the Free University in Berlin. Okay. So that's where, where I you went there first. You were there sort of close to family and things like that? At that yeah, time. yeah. So the Free University was actually built uh, with the help of the American General Consulate in, in Germany, so in West Berlin. So the, the history is that in Berlin there was the Humboldt University. So that right. was a traditional university. But that was in the East, so the, the Russian sector after ah, World War II. Right. But then several of the students moved out in protest because of the ideological components of that university <clears throat> and went into the American sector where the free university, that's why it's called free university, was founded in this. a movie theater. <laughs> Are you, uh, yes. stop it now. And really? It, yeah. So the Americans helped with it. And then it ended up in this area in, in, in the west, uh, southwest of, of Berlin. Uh, where you wouldn't really put a university usually because it's it's <laughs> you a put very a movie theater there. Yeah, movie theater. It's a very posh <laughs> area. The lots of villas and all of uh -huh. this. So several of the institutes are still in these villas. In any case, so it had strong ties to U.S. always. Oh, and wow. so there was this exchange program with several universities in the U.S. And so I was successful getting one of these stipends. Excellent. So I spent a year at Vanderbilt University working with people there. And that was really cool because in Germany, we just learned a lot through like textbook and reading about stuff. We didn't get to do a lot. You it's didn't get to like do research experiments, experiments yeah. and stuff as an undergraduate? That's right. Exactly. Oh, so man. the assumption is, was basically that for, for four years, you are learning how to do it and then you start doing it. I see. I mean, th that's not true for every single professor, <laughs> but that's kind of the, that's how it was mostly. Then going to Vanderbilt, I realized I yeah. was supposed to design an experiment in yeah. each seminar. Oh, like yeah. that was like the I final. I got started yeah. doing extra credit assignments. I did my, my my first publication grew out of an extra credit assignment in an undergraduate. Oh, class. I see. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So so I, I really love that to to try out ideas and um, uh, get cooking uh, right away. Uh, yeah. Even if it's like in the end, it just doesn't work out. It's not the point. It's not. It's just uh, right. being no, no, no. going it's through the going exercise. Through the motion, get, That's getting, right. Getting uh, accustomed to to thinking that way. Yeah. And doing that stuff. Right. Yeah. You you went right into grad school? Yeah, I went right into grad school. I mean, the, the system in Germany works differently. You start your PhD. All you do is your dissertation. And you did that at Max Planck. That's right. I applied for grad school in the U.S., but then I, I got the offer from Mike Tomazello to, to be his PhD student 
I mean, it's, a, it's very different from a university because it's a pure research institution. The Max Planck Institute for Evolution and Anthropology, when, where I was, what's so exciting about it is that uh, you can do this work with, with children, but also with, with apes. With, yeah. So there is a collaboration with the zoo in Leipzig where all four great ape species, so chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans are available. Wow. Um, so they're just That's amazing. like for the visitor. So yeah. it's just a regular zoo. But then it's designed in a way that um, researchers from the Max Planck Institute can can run these studies. And yeah, that was awesome. So I did and that the, for three years. The rest years. is freaking history, man. You yeah. Took, took off like a rocket. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it's been it's been really tremendous. Yeah. Now let's hear a little bit about that history, which means we get to talk about the babies again, as well as some chimps. Part of the reason I wanted to talk to you so badly is that I've been just an incredible fan of your research going back at least until, gosh, when was the the Wernicken et al. paper where you got those? 2006. Great, the 2006. Helping yeah, 2006 or 2004, something like that. It's 2006. Yeah, right. Yeah. Love that paper. Thanks. Holy shit. <laughs> I, I uh, was sort of obsessed about that paper for a long time uh-huh. because of the obvious and age-old question about human nature as, yeah. as mm-hmm. fundamentally cooperative versus fundamentally sort of selfish and competitive. From a natural selection perspective, uh, it's, it is the case that everything has to contribute one way or the other through to indirect genetic means. inheritance. That's right. right. So, so that is that is clearly the case. But for a psychologist, the question is more about what are the motivations behind that. We are not just consciously all the time thinking about some selfish benefit we gain from our actions. I'm a developmental and comparative psychologist, so I think that by studying children and comparing the behaviors of humans, especially children, with that of our closest evolutionary relatives, such as chimpanzees, exactly, we can gain insight into the origins of of human behaviors. To study young kids where you need nonverbal tasks, and also study chimps where obviously you need nonverbal tasks. What that means is basically you need to design an experiment that's really simple to understand, that is just intuitive. And with chimps, there are not a lot of subjects you can test so what you have to do is to really extract it, to just say, I need one comparison, like t- experimental condition versus control. There's no way of doing like a multivariate design right. Right. Um, right. or control for all kinds of things. So it kind of helps to think about kids' studies when you know that you have to do the equivalent thing with chimps. Yeah, Because right. then you... How are you going to do it? Yeah, right. So yeah. you, from the beginning, have to figure out a way to make it really intuitive and simple um, because you know that that you want to do that with chimps as well. Helping behaviors seem a really good uh, case study in some sense to get at what are the motivations behind our apparently altruistic acts and what are also the cognitive abilities do you need to have to engage in them. Uh, A lot of the literature in psychology, behavioral economics, and other areas assumes that we are basically only selfishly motivated um, as humans. Yeah. And then over development, we, for example, acquire norms about being good citizens or, right, right. Uh, or following social norms and, and so forth. We have to guide our children to the point of being pro-social and cooperative. And, and Exactly. I mean, there's no question about the <laughs> fact that we are being socialized into being cooperative in, in certain sure, circumstances. Sure. So, so these factors... I was going to say, I have, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old, and they're little beasts. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. But they may be, and that's kind of the question we ask, that at least under some Just circumstances, they're, they're they may be, may be uh, altruistic as well. Yeah, I'm so, sure they are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you're I, away, I, I, I'm when you're sure that, there. <laughs> all right, I'm sure their teachers or somebody else sees it. <laughs> <laughs> I see. That's right, yeah. <laughs> you try to create a situation where you rule out certain um, factors that may influence that. Like, yeah. do they do it because they want to impress the teacher or they do it and want to impress right, the parent? Right, right. And so with our experimental studies, they're experimental because what we create is a situation where we try to control for all these other factors that we kind of the, have the parent be out of the room. Or in the, obviously yeah. there are no teachers around and so forth. So what does the kid do? Um, when all when, these when they have no other are, uh, yeah. you know motivation or secondary gain or something like that. That's right. So that's kind of how we implement these these experiments to create different kinds of situations in which uh, a, a person, an experimenter, has a problem. Um, so 
the experimenter is is hanging towels on the clothesline and then mm. drops it accidentally on the floor. Right. Or the person wants to write a letter and then the pen drops on the ground and he can't get it back. Yeah. Or the um, the person wants to put a stack of magazines into a cabinet, uh, but the doors are closed and right. he's helplessly bumping into the yeah. doors and can't get it Is that you, by the way, you can see those videos online. Is that you in the videos? That, that is me as a grad student. Yeah, I, I had to <laughs> be a good actor to, to do that. Oh. Yes, oh. right. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. Um, so the, as a developmental psychologist, you, you have to acquire a lot of different skills, uh, yeah. one of them being intentionally clumsy in front of a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> so these are those kind of situations we created, and then we wanted to see uh, when an 18-month-old, this was a, a first study, is observing these failed attempts to retrieve an object or put stuff away, will they be spontaneously helpful? And then we found that um, kids will help um, across a variety of situations. So they're helpful with objects. Spontaneously. Spontaneously, spontaneously. exactly. So we... We had it where um, there's the parent is sitting in the room in this initial experiment, but the parent's supposed to be silent, not say anything. And the experimenter is also directly asking the kid for help. It's just indicating the problem, like reaching for an object or bumping into doors. Right. Usually, if they have at all, they do so within just a few seconds. So it's not that they, they're waiting for some kind of communicative cue about the problem. So they, they seem to be really spontaneously helpful in, in these situations. Uh, even novel situations. Yeah. So one potential reason why kids may help with an object that fell down and person can't get it back is that they have been in that situation before right. and people have helped them or they have been rewarded or told what to do in these kinds of situations. And so they, they bring that knowledge into the lab and that's why they help in th these ways. Yeah. But what we also did was we created a situation that's completely novel uh, so they could not have encountered that particular like problem what? before. Like what was the novel one? So what we did is we built a box that had a hole on top and a flap on the side. Uh -huh. And another experimenter first showed them the kit this box. And so they showed th that you can use the flap if you want to retrieve something from it. Uh -huh. um, and so kids demonstrate that they can do that. So they did do it once. And then later during our study, I come into the room and I stir my coffee uh -huh. that I placed on top <laughs> of that box, and then my spoon falls through the hole. Uh, and um, ignorant and clumsy as I am, I try to squeeze my hand through that tiny hole and can't get my spoon back. And what we found uh -huh. is that in this case, the kids open the flap and retrieve the spoon. Yeah. So it indicates that they use a, a skill they've just learned um, already in helpful ways. So this is a situation that could not have been reinforced at home by the parent or someone. So we know the history, basically, right. of that particular behavior, and they already use it for helpful purposes. Kids are maybe quite um, smart in their helping, that they're making the right inferences um, in these situations and, and know how to help. I guess really the question that comes up for me is why aren't the chimps doing it? What, what, is the, what is the missing piece? Is it, yeah. is it, is it information? Is it motivation? So with chimps, it is the case that they do it under some circumstances. What circumstances did chimps help? Spontaneously? Spontaneously, too. So what we did, the idea is that we tried to look at chimps in comparison to learn something about basically the biological foundation of this or evolutionary yeah, right, one. Is right. this something that's unique to our species? That's the comparative part. Exactly. Aside from the question whether it's human unique or it's also found in other animals is that it can also tell us about the origin of this behavior um, in humans. Because if it is the case that, say, some learning some moral code or being rewarded by parents for appropriate behavior and so forth is necessary for these behaviors to emerge, then we would not expect that to exist in right. chimpanzees, right. Right? right? Because they're not, um, mothers are not rewarding their um, offspring for appropriate behavior, and they cannot verbally express any moral code if they even have one, right? Yeah. So, so with that, we can address to what extent that is really a necessary prerequisite. So when we tested chimps, we originally did not expect that they would be helpful at all. But what we found was in an initial study that when, in this case, a keeper who was basically their surrogate mother was uh, dropping stuff on the ground and couldn't get get it back. Three chimps that we tested in this paradigm were willing to help her. 
So at least in situations where she was reaching for an object she couldn't get back, they would also be helpful. They wouldn't help in this novel box paradigm, and they wouldn't also help opening doors so that she could put stuff away. So their helping was not quite as flexible as Was that because saw. they couldn't understand what those other things were about? Or yeah, because- that, is a, that is a possibility. So yeah. this is, maybe it just doesn't make much sense for them that someone would yeah, put would something away. Open, yeah, right. Exactly. You, what do you want to put something in that little thing for? Right. It doesn't make any sense. That's right. If someone does not show a behavior, we don't know, is it due to some motivational difference? Is it due to some ability to understand the situation? Yeah. So it, from that study, it's not totally clear why they did it in, in one situation, not in another. When we tested 14-month-old infants, so, so even younger ones than wow. from the original study, they would help in situations like the chimps, where it was with objects that were out of reach. But when it was about this novel box or opening a a cabinet, also 14-month-old infants were not helpful. It seems plausible that it has something to do with more understanding of the situation. Yeah. uh, Because it is more complex to read the goal of the other person who's reaching through a hole into a box than overtly reaching for an object that's just visibly in front of you. And it's also easier to know how to help when you just have to hand something over and when you have to open a box for someone and right, so forth. Right, right. I mean, you have to read the intention of the person. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not always clear to me, you know, reading this sort of the literature on intention, what intention in requires, you know? Th- is it only yeah. that I know that you want a thing or do I have to also understand what the thing is that you want? Right, it's right. It's a little bit of a, uh, yeah. I yeah, mean, that's right, exactly. It permeates the literature. Yeah, that's true. So that that's right. And I think that in uh, these contexts where someone's just reaching for an object, all you need to know is what is the thing the other yeah. one wants yeah, and yeah. not like some complex connection of different means and ends relationships. So so that's, that's maybe a, a reason. So one possibility then is that also chimps are willing to help, but they're just maybe cognitively not quite as flexible in making the right inferences about uh, around different kinds of right. situations. This was kind of was still the starting point for our projects because obviously it leaves many questions unanswered. So this is when you were working with Michael Tomasello. That's right. So this was um, this all of this started when I was a graduate student of Mike yeah. Tomasello at the Max Planck Institute for Evolution and Anthropology. What a great experience. Yeah, no, that was great. Just one anecdote about how the, the whole thing started was that before I came to the Institute before when I was basically when I was applying, I was reading some work by Andrew Meltzoff um, uh-huh. yeah. on intention reading, famous work on imitation. Yeah, right. So yeah. basically, the the paradigms are that um, a child, an eighteen month old. So this is <laughs> and uh, there's uh, there's a reason why we test eighteen month old uh, to begin with. Sees someone, for example, trying to pull a, apart a dumbbell, but never it succeeds. So what the kids see is someone. Um, holding this dumbbell and the, the fingers are always slipping off one end. When the dumbbell is given to the kid, the kids do not repeat that behavior. They reproduce what the person was trying but failing to do. So they pull it apart. Okay. And so this is an indication that children are not just looking at what's observable, but they're yeah. making inferences about the intention the person had. Right. And so They know what the person wants to do. That's right. Yeah makes all the difference. What I was then thinking was that helping may actually be another way of testing their ability to read intentions. Okay. Because in order to help, you also have to be able to understand that what you see is not what the person wanted. So someone reaching for a dropped object is not doing some gymnastic exercise. The person wants to have the object back. Or bumping right, into the right, doors is right. not what the person wants. What the person wants is to actually put stuff so, away. So there's real social cognition involved in, in this. It's, 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 it's a combination of knowing and being motivated to help. That's right. Exactly. Right. I thought originally this was just a, another test of this social cognitive ability to read intentions. When I then started as a PhD student, I suggested this as a test f- for that. But then more senior people were, were saying like, if you drop something in front of a kid, they, they just want to keep it. There's just no <laughs> right. way they will give it back to you. I had never worked with chimps, and people working with chimps like, there's just no way. They just want to hold on to objects. So there was really no inkling among your senior colleagues and advisors that, that the kids would spontaneously help you in this way? At least not in these kinds of situations. So they yeah. thought that maybe if it's about holding on to objects, they just 
wouldn't want to give it up. And so, but then when I was piloting for a different study, which was about like collaboration, so the different thing that played with a, with a kid, and there was a table tennis ball that we bounced around, uh-huh. and then that ball rolled away uh, when we were sitting on the floor. And then with this helping study in the back of my mind, I then pretended like I couldn't get it back and I was stretching towards that table tennis ball. This toddler walked up and gave it to me. Ah, and so when I the showed... The light bulb came on. Yeah, exactly. And when I showed that to Mike Tomazelli, I said, okay, so maybe there's something to it. And that's how we then started to run this study and, and we're more optimistic about the possibility that at least these kids would help. Mike Tomazello had started this theory about collaboration and shared intentions being the thing that differentiates humans right. from, from right. others. And then I come in with the data of the chimpanzees actually yeah. being helpful. And I remember him saying, <laughs> my life would be easier if they hadn't done that. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yep. But, That's how that goes, isn't right, it? Right, right. But this oh, is well. but this is the thing. I mean, Mike Tomasell is amazing because he's in the end is really about exploring. <laughs> so sure. So chimps do spontaneously help under certain circumstances. That's in the two thousand six paper. Yeah. It's still qualitatively different, it seems, than what's going on in humans. That's so right. he's not he's not completely wrong. No, 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 not earlier. at all. No, that's and right. It, and especially the the sort of shared intention as a social cognitive task also seems to have some unique human qualities to it right absolutely in the end it's more of a f- fine-tuning of that yeah. uh, idea than right. than throwing it out first of all the claim about shared intentionality is more about um, you could say jointness or together right so that it's more like a notion of we are doing something together right. that still holds true when when chimpanzees work together on a task say there's a board with food yeah on it but it's outside and the only way to get it is to pull a rope that is threaded around the board. And then in some situations, the ends of the rope are so far away that only two chimps right, can do right. it together. Um, chimps are able to do that. There have been great demonstrations of that, like Satoshi Hirata from Japan, Japan and Alicia yeah. Melis, who was a grad student and postdoc in the, in the Max Planck Institute as well. But then there is still the question about what are the chimps thinking? Right. And... What seems to be the case is that chimps are maybe thinking about the other individual more as a social tool, as, as it's a, called. As an instrumental resource. That's right. Exactly. So I understand, if we were chimps, I would understand I need you to solve that task, but I don't care about you in this particular yeah. context only as yeah. long as you're helpful that I get my reward and you get your reward. And that by itself does not yet mean that we are thinking as a team, basically, where we're doing this together. I, I also think about some of Peggy Clark's research at, you know, at, at Yale in the, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. And she made this distinction between exchange, relationships. social exchanges, exchange yeah, yeah. relationships, and communal right. behaviors. And she, she started arguing, she's one of the first people, I think, really writing in this way, that it's intrinsically reinforcing for humans right. to, to engage in communal activity. Yeah, yeah. That, that was the goal. That That's there right. was no other goal. That yeah. Just, just joining together and form, forming relationships is, is sufficient reinforcement. Yeah. And so sort of a lot of, lot of, you know, ideas spring forth from that. But one of the things that I wonder is if this applies to some of the work that you're doing, that that it almost isn't even about helping behavior per se, but that helping behavior is one way to get to the goal, which is the joining. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a really good point. And I think that that motivates a lot of the behaviors we see in several contexts so that indeed um, kids often will choose to just do something together, even though the other one is not really necessary. So they could do it alone, right. but they choose to do it uh, together. Like there's some studies by my colleague Maria Greffenhain who, who showed that kids will likely choose to rather like pass on a, a tool to the other ones so that they can do it together, even though they, they could just take right. over all by themselves. So they right. seem to... Uh, and There's no obvious gain to doing right. it together other than that you're doing it together. And that's, that's sort right. Of, it's, it's interesting that, that we're only, it seems like there's a, there's a growing number of re- researchers that are, that are waking up to this fact. Yeah, that's right. But I think that still the, in the situations that we create in our helping studies is that we have, um, kind of rule it out by having the kids 
um, like do it like 10 times or 20 times. And each time they help, the other person is just continuing with her own task and is never really so acknowledging. So they for it. That's right. So if the kids really think that <laughs> handing over a pen means that now we are drawing together or something, that is just not the outcome of it. Yeah. So if, if children really, that was their ulterior motive, I, I give you your pen so that we can do something together now, then they should stop. Right. But they, but they don't. So they keep going even if, for example, in one corner of the room, the kid is playing in a ball pool, so having fun doing that. And the person in the other end of the room is dropping something. Yeah. Um, the kids crawl out of the ball pool, give the object that the person dropped, and then just head back to the ball pool to keep playing over there by themselves. So so I think that in many situations, they're really motivated to want to do stuff together. But when someone is in need, then they are also willing to help even if they don't get any kind of joint play time out of that. Do you ever uh, have a look at what happens when you sort of block their ability to help or when you make it harder for them to help? Do they give up or do they get upset or do they try to... to what oh, yeah, what happens a, there? So there's actually really interesting work by Robert Heppach and Amrisha Veish uh -huh. um, showing that when kids are not able to help and the problem is not resolved, so someone is reaching for something and they just can't get to their goal, when you measure their change in pupil dilation, so this is like a very high-end setup to, to, to do that, um, the kids seem to stay kind of distressed when this is happening. They remain basically aroused about that situation. Yeah. However, if they are able to help, that ar arousal is reduced. If someone else is helping that poor fellow who wants to get his uh, pen back or whatever they dropped, then they also are reduced in their arousal. Wow. So the, there are two, at least two things that are, can be gained from this. So one is that it's not necessary that the kid is doing the helping. Wow. So it's not that they wow, that's are fascinating. that they are thinking about Holy like shit. I want to do it like that the mastery is the thing that is m motivating it primarily. Yeah. This may be part of it, but that it's ultimately really about the other person's goal. So I want Holy you to shit. succeed and whether I help you with it or someone else helps it, you with it, that's kind of secondary. The See, main that, thing is yeah. That's amazing because I you know, I was starting talking with you to form this picture in my mind that the the helping is part of the joining right the joining together and creating a social yeah, so, yeah. socially cohesive unit uh requires my engaging with you in this in this in this experience but what you're saying is you don't, it doesn't even require that necessarily not necessarily so right. then it really becomes about satisfying the other person's goal which is truly truly helping yeah uh, without any obvious personal gain even at the level of, of creating a, a, a relationship that could be functional for other things later on. Right. Damn. What's interesting is that the connection, what you're talking about with, between helping and doing stuff together, the way you phrased it was the connection of uh, helping in order to do yes, something together. Right, yeah. And that, I think, in many cases is true, but it yeah. doesn't exhaust all the cases of helping. But the other way also from doing something together to helping exists. So... There's some work by uh, my former student, Katerina Hamann, where two kids, two, two year olds or three year olds, working together on, on a task. Uh -huh. So they basically they have to get rewards. Um, and to do that, they have to move a long rod upward until this rod with rewards is over an opening so that they can yeah. get their toys out. Okay. And then in certain situations, it's the case that the two kids work on it together. But the lucky child gets the reward halfway. Oh. And the unlucky child still needs the help from the collaborator. What we find in this study is that um, when they are working together, they are more likely to help each other out than when one is just individually working on their side of the task and the other one is working so on the other side of the task. So having some relationship, at least in the lab, no, you know, yeah. it sort of facilitates the effect. Absolutely, right. When you think about collaboration, when we think of, of working as a team, it comes with certain obligations about how we should interact with each other that goes beyond what we would do if we just view ourselves as individuals. Right. Right. So, so if we're working on a task together, um, it, it means that we want to succeed. 
And we succeeding means that I succeed and you succeed. Yeah. And so my succeeding is only fulfilled by partly of you also succeeding. Certainly around three years of age, kids have this capacity to really think about a we. Yeah. And, and I mean, at least in a diet and like two people doing something together and that it comes with certain obligations about how to treat each other and maybe also not just thinking about what are my, what am I doing, right. but also what are you doing and how it relates uh, together. So, for example, again, um, my colleague Maria Grafenhain has some interesting studies where the kid with another person is putting together a scene of farm animals. So they basically have complementary roles in, in putting this stuff together uh -huh. um, versus doing it kind of individually. The, the source memory of who did what is much worse when it's done collaboratively. So this, is, th this indicates that, I mean, in one sense, invites an interesting question that's, about, that's like, why, why are we wrong about it, right? right, right so right. it's because it's like being uh, wrong ab about memory may be bad, but maybe it's actually something that's more efficient somehow when we do it together that we're not thinking about uh, primarily my doing and your doing, but really kind of a top what's down. What's getting view, done. What's getting done, exactly. Yeah. And that it's not so much about who, yeah. who came up with what idea or something like that. Yeah. You know, we put people in the scanner in one of our studies. We put them under threat of shock. It's sort of like a Tanya Singer kind uh -huh. of study. We put people under threat of shock, and then we put their friends under threat of shock or a stranger under threat of shock. Uh -huh. And what we found is that if you look at the activation in the brain, all throughout the brain, when their selves are being under threat, yeah. or when their friend is under threat, they're hardly distinguishable. How they're, distinguish they're, they're, right. they're, they're responding to, towards the, the threat directed at the friend as if the threat is directed at the self. Oh, wow. I see. And not just in sort of prefrontal conceptual, but in like the insula where they're encoding the state of their body. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. and uh, when you look at strangers, the correlations just evaporate. There's just I no, see. no strangers. So, that, so we argued that there was this sort of neural manifestation that, that what you could see from the work of your colleague or the work of Art Aaron is sort of metaphorical is actually literally true at the way that at the level of how the brain and yeah yeah right self. Huh. it makes me start to wonder how this could have happened what's the what's the evolutionary story that leads to this this sort of miraculous but there must yeah. be some benefit to this breakdown right. between self and other and this intrinsic motivation to to join and help yeah. and well, I mean, cooperate. what's really interesting is that when you look at humans in comparison to even our closest evolutionary relatives, like like chimpanzees or other apes, is that we depend on cooperation so much more. Yeah. Um, and that is true for in modern society. We don't have society. much else. Yeah. We just have our... We have to cooperate. I mean, yeah. I assume you did not produce your own food, right? You probably got it in a grocery store, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so did I. Um, and so, so this is something where we have to really depend on others um, to do that. So this ne doesn't have to be like cooperative in a, in a narrow sense, but, but that we really depend on each other uh, as a group because no, no one individual would be able to do all this by themselves. When you look at chimpanzees, they basically forage on their own. They're moving together as a group, um, but when it comes to like obtaining the food, it's not done in a collaborative way or some kind of... So the, in humans, mostly it is the case that uh, and that's true for like hunter gatherers, so that are more reflective of our past, uh, right. evolutionary past. There is some kind of division of labor, non redundant and yeah. cooperative. Yeah, yeah, and then and then uh, food is obtained and brought back to the camp, and then shared. Whereas uh, chimpanzees just eat on the go. They pick berries or ants or something, and they just eat it, it immediately. They're not bringing they it back have, and like, have a to hearth. share it. Or a, that's a home, right. You know, a, yeah, a that's, base that they bring the stuff back to. Exactly. So there, for for them, it's not necessary when it comes at least to foraging behavior that they have to trust that what they brought back is left there and nobody else is is claiming ownership over it and these kinds of things. So so they don't have to evolve these capacities for that. The thing that maybe becomes closest to the kinds of behaviors of more collective foraging is. Uh, hunting in chimpanzees. So chimpanzees uh, hunt for basically red colobus monkeys. They are small monkeys um, that are in the, up in the trees, and then a group of males typically would, would run after them and catch them, and then uh, several individuals get some of the meat. Um, and there have been 
really impressive observations of this that, for example, it is beneficial for them to, to do it as a group. So it would not be possible for one individual to just go for, for the monkey and catch it. Yeah. Um, but if several individuals are ganging up, basically they, are, they succeed. The question is like, do they really view this as like a team effort, basically, right. the way that we described it earlier about there's some obligation about how we should interact, we should help each other out, and also we should maybe share the resources at the end. Most people have described the sharing of food afterwards more as tolerated theft. So uh -huh. that this is there is some sharing happening in the sense of sort of like what you get with wolf packs eating a maybe eating more a like carcass. that exactly so exactly so that typically one chimp would catch the monkey and can hold on to it but then others approach as well and want to get some of the meat okay. and so then the one holding on to the carcass has to make a decision about whether to let others have some so that they basically are pleased and don't and let go or whatever, or risk um, fighting over the carcass and maybe losing everything. It's not based upon some contract of like, okay, you get some, I get some. It's basically being harassed. Right. It leads up to an individual decision-making process. Should I just hold on to it and want to keep all of it? Or should I just let some go? And when we run these kinds of studies with uh, chimpanzees in, in uh, an experimental context, and um, we actually find that chimpanzees do not share stuff after they've spontaneously. spontaneously when they collaborate or something. So we're not doing anything with monkey meat, um, but we do it with, with like banana right, slices and so right. forth or grapes, where uh, we create situations where children or chimpanzees, so try to make, keep it as parallel as possible, are either individually or collaboratively working towards obtaining resources like toys in the case of kids or uh -huh. grapes in the ca case of um, chimpanzees. And then we see what happens if one ends up with more than the other. Got it. What we find is that when two three-year-olds are working together uh, for, say, four marbles, but one ends up with three and the other one only with one, they're likely to equalize things. How? Do they fight? No, they don't. So this is are interesting. Yeah, they're not fighting. They usually... They must not be siblings. They're not siblings. That's right. So these are the <laughs> kids that know each other from daycare, right. but they're not. They're okay. not genetically so you, related. So you take out the day-to-day -day relationship of potential issues, and you just have stra relatively stranger kids to each other. Yeah. Oh, no, they're they're familiar. They're familiar, but, uh, but they're not. They're at yeah. Daycare. They're daycare, and then they either work on this together. Yeah. And one ends up with three, the other one with one. In that case, they often will like give the extra one to the other, or take only two, so let the other one have the one to make it equal. Um, if there is some kind of protest, it usually happens only by the one who has less in this collaborative context. If someone says, hey, I have less, then um, the other one will give. Views, it as a, views it as a good argument, basically, and lets the other one have that. And that's compared with the condition where the one kid worked on one side of the apparatus alone, and the other one on the other side of the apparatus alone, and one ends up with three and the other with, with one. And in that case, they just accept the ah, inequality. Got it. So holding the relationship constant, basically, right? Yeah. These are also kids yeah. from the daycare, and they know each other to the same extent as the kids who collaborated. But the difference is really in how these resources were obtained. When we run the same basic study with chimps, they are also successful at doing that. Um, and they are also letting their partner have this extra resource. Yeah. But whether this was done after they worked on it individually or they worked on it collaboratively has no effect. So for, for chimps, at least, it doesn't seem to create a special status that we are collaborators right. um, to right. the extent to right. which how we share stuff with each other. Interesting. One thing that's really fascinating about the chimps is that for them, the social relationship matters a lot in these yeah. collaborative situations. So again, this is work by my colleague Alicia Meles, who put two chimps together that were tolerant with each other. So she measured that by basically, can they eat out of the same bowl? Does one <laughs> displace the other? It's not characteristic of the individual, but on the dyadic level, right? Okay. So A is t uh, in a tolerant relationship with B, okay. but is in an intolerant relationship with, with C. C. Then when you put A and B together, when they are pulling at this rope thing to get rewards, they are actually successful. If 
A is working with C, it wouldn't even happen at all. So when there is like an intolerant relationship that's often of like a more dominant male with a subordinate one, they wouldn't even engage in the task. The reasoning is that probably they see that there's just no point in collaborating because the dominant is just, just going to take, take everything. It. Exactly. Take so I'm just not even going to start. I, I'm not going to start. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes it's also the case, I think that, I mean, Alicia was saying that the dominant chimps are so dumb, they just want to uh, monopolize the apparatus. <laughs> like they rather would, would just want to take the rope yes, yes. than to have the other then one touch the, the, yeah. the other end. It's, so this is something where maybe the dominance is just so much more important than obtaining the food or everything is viewed as just another way of showing dominance that the calorie benefit from this is just secondary and it's yeah. not going to happen. And that's also important from a, for an evolutionary story about it, that maybe these capacities are there to some extent, but they're still fragile because they appear only in certain types of situations. That's you, the, true. The capacities meaning cooperation or... or yeah. yeah. So like in this case, to what extent are chimpanzees able to collaborate on a task where two have to work together yeah. uh, to, for some mutualistic benefit or also the, the helping task where... They do it in certain contexts, but not in others. If you look at like the basic capacity and remove several interfering factors, then you can see that it's kind of there. What that means is you no longer have to ask about the transition from chimps to humans. Like, where did it come from? Because it kind of was there. It was already there. Sort of some... proto That's right. type uh, was, was already available. Exactly. For... for evolution to act upon natural That's right. selection to act upon exactly yeah. so so that it's not something that comes there de novo yes. but it's something that's there in limited form and then it can maybe spread um if if other things change yeah. and so one thing that people have argued is that humans are just less dominance hierarchy oriented than than um our close evolutionary relatives that like the dominant ones are probably empowered by the masses, right? Like, yeah. I mean, in a yeah, democracy, yeah. that's obviously the most modern yeah. version. But that is also true to some extent in, in more traditional societies, maybe, where if the dominant individual is just too dominant, that it just really hurts everyone, they will gang up they'll, they'll, against, yeah. the, against That'll them. even happen in some, you know, if you look at Robert Sapolsky's early work on, on uh, baboons, that even happens in that, baboons. Well, yeah, that's yeah. right, right. So, this so again, one, you have this non-de novo uh, that's right. situation. Yeah. Yeah. And then so yeah, so that so this is with that so that you can see that these different components are maybe there and then when foraging maybe depends much more on doing things cooperatively than than just individual foraging that then all the kind of ingredients kind of come together. But this is the thing like with many things in evolution or maybe all of them, all of these are kind of just prerequisites and you can never say like this now must happen right. as like the next step and very often it's like maybe it happened but just didn't con survive like the, yeah. that it just yeah. uh, was not beneficial in the in the long term um but so yeah you need a lot of stuff to to come together for for the kind of the, a new uh, behavior or a new kind of social structure ever to really take hold yeah and you need to understand what kind of selective forces were available to shape the critter in, in one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. This right. is one of the things that I wonder a lot about. What is the evolutionary story likely to actually be? When you, when you, when you get into to, you know, questions of cooperation, it, I think it's relatively easy to put together the story of how cooperation can be beneficial now. But the question yeah, is how right. it gets selected for. And you have these crazy battles you know, I I, I, yeah, talk, yeah. I talked with uh, David Sloan Wilson at one point for one of these. Oh, yeah. These, wow. these interviews. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we talked about the, you know, multi-level selection and group selection theories where where you basically have bands of, of humans going to war with each other. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And then I've talked to Sarah Blaffer Hurdy, who says nah, that there's no reason to think any of that. Uh -huh. Because, uh, because <laughs> first of all, the archaeological record doesn't suggest much warfare in, yeah, in, yeah. in uh, human evolution. And and second of all, it's just not necessary that you have conflict to, to create a, an evolutionary adaptive advantage to cooperation. Do you have any so, thoughts about this? I mean, one thing I'm, I'm really wondering about um, that relates to especially what Sarah Blaffer-Hurdy uh, has uh, been working on is the question 
why young children would engage in these kinds of behavior. So, so one thing is like to explain why would humans do it at all, and why does it? Why do we have cooperate so much more than? I mean, nobody would question that that we cooperate much more than uh, oh, yeah, in right. many more contexts, and we're much more dependent on that than our closest evolutionary relatives. But why? young kids why would they have that capacity and so there, there are different reasons why that may be the case like one is that it's just something that um, kind of randomly pops up their kids are just smarter and they just show it early on even though it has really no effect so it could have also have emerged later in development yeah. so basically whether this capacity to help emerges at two three four five six seven years it doesn't matter right um, right or it could be that you just need to get an early jump start to to acquire the the skills. So like kids babble and talk early on, but before they are really competent speakers, maybe it, it just takes uh, many many years, or until they become really good tool users, it also takes many years. So they just have to start practicing early in some sense. But again, the the first in other time words, helping is a form of play. In, in uh, that's play. right, exactly. And then and the but the first time that it really has an impact. Is is late in development. Yeah. But then, um, what another pos- a third possibility is that actually there's a reason for this to emerge early, because children make a difference, and so this is something you wouldn't observe in a modern society where kids are not helping with whatever tax returns or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. They're, they're just not able to to do that. But when you look at more traditional societies, you see that kids early on help in many different ways. And so this is what Zebra Hardy has pointed out, for example, that to raise a kid, it takes a village. You really yeah. need... Th- th- I don't know, 30, 3 million calories or something to get them to 18 years old, and there's no way for a single parent to provision that kid. That's right. A chimp mother can kind of do it. So there is this paradox that in comparison to chimpanzees, humans have a much shorter interbirth interval. Right. So we reproduce much more often, but it takes much longer for uh, an individual to reach maturity and be self-sustaining. Right. So how is it possible? these crazy brains. Exactly. Yeah. And so how is that possible that these two things seem to be in conflict? So the argument by many people is that it's other people who are helping out. So this right. could be the reason why their grandmothers are yep. still around yep. even though they're not reproducing that whole hypothesis right or it could be that just generally like other relatives are helping or that siblings are helping but and so still you're yeah. you're having other people help the kid what's the kid giving back but this is then the point that when you look at some work by Karen Kramer who is a behavioral ecologist who traced what are the basically the, the energy contribution to the energy budget in traditional societies? You, you see that um, starting around two, three years of age, children are already kind of contributing a little bit. Really? So, so, for example, the groups have to collect firewood or water at the, at the well or somewhere um, and bring it there. And then that these young kids are already carrying a little bit of firewood yeah. and carrying a little bit of water. Uh, yeah. And that kids at four or five years of age may take care of their younger siblings and so forth. So, Do you have kids? No, I don't. Well, but, I got to tell you, my kids, three and five years old, uh, starting when my oldest was probably two and a half or three, want to help. All uh-huh. the time, and they want to do help in ways that's kind of a pain in the ass sometimes because they want to like hover over the stove, uh, and yeah, cook, yeah, yeah. You know, participate in the cooking, and they want to set the table, and they want to do they they just want to do this stuff. Yeah, uh, and and it's getting to the point now where they're starting to do it a little bit. Yes, it's see? crazy. Yeah, yeah. How about that? We're not even a hunter gatherer society, and they still mm-hmm. yeah right yeah. right yeah. So exactly. So maybe maybe you can take advantage of, yeah, of their yeah. helpful inclinations <laughs> in your household. Yeah. I just need to get more adults to provision my children and yeah. be better off. Right. So what this opens up is the possibility that there is kind of through some maybe kin mechanism like that there is some benefit to to helping out kin that um it is actually good for very young children to already have these uh, helpful inclinations. I mean yeah. uh, it, it's not like when you look at at what time do they produce more energy than they consume, that's not until adolescence. Yeah. Um, but they're already contributing uh, uh, much, much earlier. 
But the other thing, it, it, it does seem to be that helping and cooperating and stuff is what humans do. And so little kids are doing what humans do and yeah, their little right. kid to their little kid extent. Yeah. And they're going to grow up to be big kids and adults that do that a lot more. Right. I right. Mean, you, know, you know, even though, according to maybe Kramer and Blaffer Hurdy and other people, you know, no single adult can provision a, all that it, of what a kid needs. Yeah. Um, they're still working all a lot. Yeah. Adults, right, right. adults put a lot of effort into into this stuff. They're, oh, absolutely. It's, yeah. It's There's huge, no question huge about amount the, of work. the yeah. The ratio there, but yeah. <laughs> there's at least a little. So you bit. gotta you gotta ramp up. You gotta you gotta prepare for it. Yeah, and, yeah, that's and right. Start early. That's right. I mean, I think I've not, when I've laid out like the different reasons why this might happen. I mean, they're not actually mutually yeah, exclusive, sure, right? Sure. So that, but it's um, uh, it's maybe not just preparing oneself for the future, but that already young kids, maybe not like at eighteen months, but but yeah, like yeah, fairly early, early are, are are already uh, gearing up to to actually um, contribute at least uh, whatever is within their means. Wow, this is great stuff, man. And now you're at Harvard, right? I am, yes. Holy shit. How did yeah. that happen? Well, you just I mean, applied, applied for the job? <laughs> yes, just yeah. like that? You just, just sent in your application? Well, I mean, yes. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I mean, yeah, they had a That's job great. offer. And, That's yeah. great. Added, and things added. are going well in Boston? You like yeah. Boston okay? I do, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, a little good, cold, it's a good... but I guess it's a little cold in Leipzig, too. A bit more extreme in both ends, like a little hotter and more humid in the uh -huh. summer and colder and more snow in the winter. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah so it's... Yeah. And how long the... have you been at Harvard now? Seven years, yeah. Wow, so. that's great. That's yeah. Great. Tell you what, I, I could talk with you like this for hours. Okay, but yeah. Thank you so that was much fun, for yeah. chatting with me. That was, Thanks for that having was me. That was great. I think this is really interesting just because of how young the kids are. Like, I've seen plenty of kids be helpful, but 14 to 18 months are the kids in these videos. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things about how young they are is that it, it suggests, at least, that they've had a relatively small amount of enculturation to sort of teach right. them how to... That's sort of the point. One of the things that sort of cracks me up about it is how... They get upset if they can't intervene and help. Yeah. They're kind of like, okay, we've set up this situation where I'm helping you accomplish this task. And when he stops or they're stopped from helping him, they're a little impatient. They're <laughs> yeah. They're totally impatient and, and hilariously eager, too. I, I love the little smiles on their faces when they, when they stack the little blue whatever those things were, little blue plates. Yeah. Um, you know, each time that kid in the video puts a plate on top of the stack that doofus <laughs> bumbling Felix has dropped, he gets this big smile on his face. It's clearly intrinsically joyful to join in with Felix and share Felix's goal, no matter what the goal is. Right. And that's incredibly profound when it comes to understanding the human animal. We know every action an organism takes is, is to further its own survival, but like, what are the steps to get there? Like, what are the steps from a, a baby picking up a block that he drops on the floor and can't reach to like the, the passing on of that baby's genome? Yeah, and you know, <laughs> one of the things that's really interesting about that is that increasingly we're seeing a resurgence of something called multi-level selection or group level selection, and you know, that's still very controversial, and I don't want to, uh, you know, overstate this, but one thing that's interesting about trying to further your own survival is you can ask the question, well, whose survival? Mine, mm -hmm. yours, or ours? And the group level selection suggests that one force is our survival, that the compulsion to cooperate is because we are the organism, not me or you. Well, next episode, we'll be hearing from Sarah Kavanaugh. What can you tell us about her? Sarah is a sort of psychological generalist. She's become really committed to how we teach psychology and how we teach in general. Okay, sounds great. Folks, the music of Circle of Willis is written and performed by Tom Stoffer and his band, The New Drakes. For more information on how to purchase their music, visit our website, circleofwillispodcast.com. <laughs>
You can also find all of our old episodes on the website. If you haven't already, subscribe to Circle of Willis wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Twitter and Instagram for more updates. Circle of Willis, human stories of the science that shapes our world.